Hey, I'm Kale, and today I'm looking at Revolver by the Beatles. This is what the people want. Go along with it. Revolver is the Beatles' seventh studio album, released August 5th, 1966. And it's considered to be one of the most influential albums of all time. Not just, like, of the 60s or by the Beatles, just of all time. Like, Rubber Soul were the stepping stones, but Revolver was the finished product. Well, actually, I guess Sgt. Pepper would be the finished product, but... The personnel is as follows. John Lennon, on, John Lennon on vocals, rhythm guitar, acoustic guitar, organ, and harmonium. Paul McCartney on vocals, bass guitar, rhythm guitar, lead guitar, and clavichord. George Harrison on vocals, all kinds of guitars, um, sitar, and tambura. Ringo Starr on drums, vocals, and cowbell. For the non-Beatles personnel, there's Anil Bhagwat on tabla. Alan Civil on French horn and George Martin on piano, as well as producing the album. In the first couple months of 1966, the Beatles sort of took a break, but came back to the studio in March with some new material. At this point, they had a few fleshed out songs, uh, two of which were Rain and Paperback Writer, which were the lead singles for the album, released in April of that year. Neither of which are on the album, but they should have been in some extent. And I'm not gonna talk about those two singles on um, that single right now because they're very influential songs and they honestly warrant an entire video themselves but an interesting thing that pops up during the recording session is george's increasingly rising interest for indian music which was showcased a little bit on rubber soul and norwegian wood but not a super amount more things is during the recording of rain john lennon accidentally reverses one of the choruses and decides that that sounds cool and he's gonna put that on the song and it is utilized in a lot of songs on this album as well as tape looping which is when you feed the tape through itself basically on an infinite loop of one part that you want to put in hence the name tape loop which is also utilized all throughout this album and then all throughout like all albums after this Tape Loops was probably one of the more influential things that came out of this album. And I don't mean just every Beatles album afterwards, I mean basically every album ever afterwards. During the recording of the album, the Beatles visited a lot of concerts to gather inspiration from The Love and Spoonful, The Mamas and the Papas, Bob Dylan, Stevie Wonder, anyone who came to town really. And during the recording of this album, the Beach Boys Pet Sounds came out, which was just insanely influential on the next three Beatles albums. This all is just a very condensed, loose story of the entire recording sessions for Revolver. It would take me at least three hours to detail every single detail about the recording sessions. Um, but anyway, yeah, track by track breakdown. Track number one on the album is Taxman. Taxman was written by George Harrison entirely. The only Beatles album to have a Harrison track on its opening. Taxman is a very garage rocky song. It's very, it's almost most definitely influenced by the Who's My Generation, the album, which came out just a year prior. So the story behind the guitar solo on Taxman is kind of interesting. Basically, George Harrison and John Lennon had been fiddling around on the guitar and just couldn't get a guitar solo that felt right. And so they gave it to Paul, who just created the perfect sounding guitar solo for the song. It's a political song about the rising tax prices in Great Britain, and it name drops uh, members of the British Conservative Party. Harrison was also writing Piggies at the time, which is another political song, but it didn't make it on Revolver, and it actually was shelved until the White Album two years later. Just feeling very angsty at the time, I guess. Track number two is Eleanor Rigby. Eleanor Rigby is overrated. It's a good song, I just, there's not, I don't have anything really to talk about. Like, the arrangement's nice, like, that. that's, I guess, what I can say, but it's not very it, in, experimental on this album. It doesn't fit in. And it's a fine song, it's just, it's, it's overrated. Now, I don't want you to think that this is me coming out and hating on Eleanor Rigby, I just think it's an interesting choice to be on the album. And I talk about the music theory stuff, but it's just, it's kind of boring to talk about in like a video like this, so I'm not going to. And if we're talking about like in terms of arrangements, it's one of George Martin's best arrangements. It just feels weird to be on Revolver. And that could just be me, and I'm like 100% sure it will be. But that's, again, just me. 
Oh, but track number three is I'm Only Sleeping. I'm Only Sleeping is my favorite song on the album. We're talking influential on psychedelia. This is the song that you want to talk about. It has everything. It has tape loops. It has reverse guitar solos. It has reverse guitar solo. It's actually one of my favorite songs of all time. It's, I can't explain it really. It's just, it's I'm Only Sleeping. And John Lennon just wrote it because he's, because he was a lazy bum. And I, he just, that's so real of him. That's so real of him. Most relatable song of all time, I'm Only Sleeping. Also, there's like a bridge in the middle where there's like a bass part and John Lennon um, tells Paul to yawn and then it is immediately followed by Paul yawning. And I think that that is kind of funny. Also, the second use of reverse instrumentation in the Beatles' discography, the first being the outro to Rain. Anyway, track number four is Love You Too. Another Harrison song. Love You Too is almost entirely made up of Southern Asian instruments. And it's almost all George Harrison playing those instruments. Except for one session musician who played tabla. And I think that this was the first descent of Harrison into Indian music. Like, you could call Norwegian wood, you know, in like Indian inspired. And it is, it is. But it's not within without you. It's not, it's not, it's not Love You Too. It's, it's not. Love You Too was the second song recorded for the album, also. Track number five is Here, There, and Everywhere. Here, There, and Everywhere is just a nice little lounge ballad written by Paul McCartney. It was composed at John Lennon's house in supposedly under 15 minutes. McCartney wrote it by the pool while he was waiting for Lennon to wake up. And it was written um, after McCartney heard uh, God Only Knows by the Beach Boys, which McCartney has stated is one of his favorite songs of all time. Number six is Yellow Submarine. No oh boy. Yellow Submarine, it is the Beatles song. It is the Beatles song. Like, if you ask just a random person on the street, name three Beatles songs, one of them's gonna be Yellow Submarine. I can guarantee you that one of the songs they say is gonna be Yellow Submarine. Might be the only song they say. I and it's one of two kids' songs with Ringo on lead vocals about being underwater. That man just wants to live in the ocean. Let's just let Ringo live in the ocean, all right? What is What harm is he causing? The fame and icon status of this song is truly indescribable. Yellow Submarine really has to be just one of the most famous songs of all time. Whether you like it or hate it, it's, it's just an unstoppable force. That will not stop. Like yell like submarine merchandise, submarine toys, just submarines in the media in general are almost always depicted as like yellow now because of the song. I come up to you and I just say submarine. You think you either think of one of two things: a World War II battle submarine or a submarine with a with like one of those weird telescope things that is yellow, or the Titanic submersible. But I don't. know. That people think it's like a euphemism for drugs. This song. I really don't think so. I think it's just about John Lennon's love for submarines. I think he just really liked boats and submarines. So he wrote this song to sing about submarines, but he was too embarrassed to sing about submarines himself. So he gave the song to Ringo, which might be what happened, but the chorus itself was mostly fleshed out by Paul McCartney and the, it was really just the melody that was written by Lennon. So I don't know, maybe Paul McCartney just really liked underwater machinery. The lyrics were co-written by John Lennon, Paul McCartney, and Donovan, who is a Scottish psychedelic folk singer, who's best known for his song Season of the Witch and Mellow Yellow. Brian Jones, Marianne Faithful, Neil Aspinall, and Patty Boyd are just some of the famous people that did backing vocals on this song. It's where everyone just knew everyone that was famous in the 1960s. Closing out side one is She Said, She Said. So the story behind the song is, is odd. Basically, in... Early 1966, a party was thrown by Roger McGuinn and David Crosby of The Birds, and John Lennon, George Harrison, and actor Henry Fonda. I apologize, Peter Fonda. And naturally, they all took acid because it was 1966. So Peter Fonda starts telling some crazy stories, talking about how he almost shot himself when he was little, and just about death. And then he starts just freaking everyone out at the party, just harsh in everyone's vibe. The vibe was so harsh, you do not even know. And so John Lennon told him, he was like, man, you're freaking me out. 
stop. And Lennon was so freaked out by the occasion that immediately afterwards, he wrote this song. It was also the last song recorded for Revolver. You can tell because if you listen to some of the earlier takes of the song from earlier June in 1966, they're all just so tired of making this album that John Lennon is literally cheering them on to just finish this song already. Yeah, it was finally recorded June 21st, 1966, wrapping up recording for the album. And now opening up side two is Good Day Sunshine. Good Day Sunshine was inspired by the Love and Spoonful's song um, Daydream and is just a nice little happy summer ballad about being outside and it's summer and we're happy and it's a ballad and it's happy because it's summer and we're happy and we're outside and it's summer and the day is good because of the sunshine. That's basically the whole song. George Martin does all the piano on the song and the absolute banger of a piano solo that is on this song. It's just, wow. Nothing very notable about the song. It's just kind of, no, no story behind it or anything. It's just, we're happy and it's sunshine and we're outside and it's good day and it's sunshine. Those are actually the official lyrics to the song. Next up is And Your Bird Can Sing. This is one of the most lyrically ambiguous Beatles songs of all time. Generally, you know, Every Beatles song has some story that one of the Beatles say from one time or another. But John Lennon was just like, don't even ask me what this song is about. I don't know, okay? I don't know and I don't care, so stop asking me about Andrew Bird Can Sing. I don't care about Andrew Bird Can Sing. It was the only time he was asked that question and it was the 1980 Playboy interview and he said that about basically every single Beatles song in the 1980 Playboy interview. Some people think it's directed at Mick Jagger about his girlfriend Marianne Faithful at the time or Frank Sinatra about his daughter Nancy Sinatra, but I don't know. I don't think so. It seems very random and spiteful. And John Lennon was spiteful, but not for no reason. So I'm assuming it's just gonna stay lyrically ambiguous forever. However, the guitar on Andrew Bird Can Sing is just fantastic. The guitar is George Harrison and John Lennon syncing it up as one, but because there's a delay between one of the guitars by like 0.2 seconds, it makes the guitar sound like it's going like this. I can't describe it. It sounds like it's going like this. The guitars are going like this. You know, that really relatable moment when the guitar goes like this. And right after that fairly encouraging sounding song is another downer for no, for no one. That's the song, for no one. No one was written by Paul McCartney in the Swiss Alps in late 1965. It was about his falling apart relationship with Jane Asher, which would still go on for another three years somehow. There's a French horn solo on it by Alan Sybil, and it's one of the best French horn solos I ever heard. Given I haven't heard that many French horn solos, but this one is very good. I mean, we had a John N. Whistle Allen Civil collab. Civil also played horn on the crescendo in A Day in the Life on Sgt. Pepper. Throughout the song, the rhythm is kept by a clavichord, which is just two notes going up and down and up and down throughout the song to keep it in beat because there's like no drums on this song. And I used to think that For No One was one of the worst songs on this album. I used to be on the For No One hate train, but I can confidently say that For No One is not that bad. Still think it's better than Eleanor Rigby. Just kidding. I I, I, I like Eleanor Rigby. I'm, I'm just joking, guys. I, I like Eleanor Rigby, okay? Stop. Don't come after me. I like Eleanor Rigby. Oh boy, up next is Dr. Robert. This song was composed entirely by John Lennon. And it's about a doctor who supplies people with drugs. Not even subtle. They just straight up, that's just what the song's about. No, no metaphor. It's just what the song is about. And it could be about a lot of people. It could be about the doctor who laced John Lennon and George Harrison's tea with LSD. Or it could be Bob Dylan, who apparently gave the Beals marijuana for the first time. It could be a lot of people. And it's probably none of them. It's probably just a character that they made up. And no offense to tall, tall Paul, but it's one of the most boring bass lines in the Beatles catalog. My favorite part on the song is the bridge, the well, well, well part. It's, it's, an, it's interesting how they merge the two parts of the song together. It shows how, how fantastic of a producer George Martin really was. People think he's... People think he's overrated and he doesn't really do much, but it's just subtle things like these and non-subtle things like the arrangement in some of the songs that make him one of the greatest producers of all time. 
Next up is I Want to Tell You. I just had a weird spite angst hate for Eleanor Rigby. I just hate I Want to Tell You. I don't like that song at all. I think it's I'm not even overrated because there's no one rating it. It's just not a good song. I think it's great that George got three whole songs on a single disc album, but it's not a good song. I think that I Want to Tell You, it would have been so great if they just replaced it with Paperback Writer or Rain. Like, I know they didn't like to put singles on their album because they treated just singles like mini albums, but like this one time, just do it because I Want to Tell You, no one's coming to listen to this masterpiece of an album to listen to I Want to Tell You. But it makes up for it because the next song is Got to Get You Into My Life. Got to Get You Into My Life is a Motown-inspired Beatles song, which is interesting because the last Motown-inspired Beatles songs were just straight-up Motown girl group covers. The horn section on the song is great. It's performed by a British brass band. And it's about Paul's first experience with LSD because every song on this album is a euphemism for drugs. Except for Yellow Submarine. Not Yellow Submarine. That's just about submarines. Earth, Wind, and Fire actually has a sick cover of it from the 1977 movie Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band starring Peter Frampton and the Bee Gees and Aerosmith, in which is one of the worst films <laughs> ever produced. It's just um, like a two and a half hour movie of famous people singing Beatles songs with a st really stupid and loose storyline. Steve Martin as Maxwell, as in Maxwell's Silver Hammer, It makes me sad to watch. However, if it is available to you, I suggest you watch it because as it is very bad and very bad, it's very funny. And the Earth, Wind, and Fire version of God's Get You Into My Life is fire. No pun intended. Got to Get You Into My Life was actually originally not supposed to have a brass section and it sounded very boring without one. And I'm very glad they decided to put it in at the last second. Closing out Revolver is Tomorrow Never Knows. Tomorrow Never Knows is one of, I think not even one of, really the first use of elements of avant-garde in pop music. Uses so many tape loops, so many distortions, just really utilizes everything that they were working on in this album. To me, it really seems like the finished product, the amalgamation of this album. You know, they were working with tape loops, they were working with reversing, you know, instrumentation, they were working with distortion, and then they like got it all together and then they put it in this one song and Tomorrow Never Knows. The lyrics are basically an interpretation of the Tibetan Book of the Dead, or more accurately, the modernized version of the Tibetan Book of the Dead, The Psychedelic Experience by Timothy Leary. John Lennon read in late 1965, and which is when he started uh, writing the song. It's really an interesting song to listen to. <laughs> Very original statement. But like the bass line is like hypnotic kind of, and just the odd sound effects and like making other instruments sound like other instruments by running them through different amps. Like John Lennon's vocals were run through an amp that's meant for organs, as in like a Hammond organ, not human organs. I don't know why I felt the need to specify that. Actually the seagull noises that are thrown just throughout the whole song is actually a distorted version of Paul McCartney laughing, which was then, you know, distorted, pitched up, pitched upwards and then reversed thing just came trotting towards me like Timmy just fell down a well. And before I close out the track by track breakdown, I want to talk about this thing at the end of Tomorrow Never Knows that I've been searching all around the internet for just anyone talking about this. At the very end, there's a, in like the 2009 version of the song, it's very buried, buried and you can't really hear it at all. But in the, ver in the old mix and this uh, 2022 mix, you can hear it more. Basically, at the very end, there's like a conga piano, like a conga lung piano, like a salsa sort of piano groove. And it's very catchy. And I don't know if it's like, if it was like just an already recorded thing or they recorded it while in the studio or if they recorded it for another song that was never made, but I can't find anyone talking about this anywhere on the internet. And I wanna see if anyone knows what I'm talking about. But yeah, that'll do it with the track by track breakdown. Now let's get into my thoughts.
I don't know if this counts as my thoughts, but I'm gonna talk about the cover art for a second because I haven't really done that in any of my other videos, but I feel like I should. So this is the cover art. Basically, it was designed by Klaus Vormann, who were the Beatles, who was the Beatles' friend from when they lived in Hamburg for when they were just as a band that was basically just playing in Hamburg. And he played bass, I'm pretty f f sure, with them for a while, and he was also a very good artist. And basically, he slapped together this cover in around April of 1966, where he just put a bunch of pictures of the Beatles from different, you know, like publicity photos, and he and then he put them over light sketches of the Beatles, and it's, in my opinion, one of the best co album covers of all time. And then the back cover is just a picture of them in the studio. But now my actual thoughts. This sort of teeter totters between being my favorite and being my second favorite Beatles album. It's always between this or Magical Mystery Tour. I find myself having different phases of Revolver. Like this time last year was a Revolver phase. And right now I'm sort of in a Magical Mystery Tour phase, but I thought it'd be cool to revisit what I was feeling last year by doing Revolver. When don't try to come at me and being like, Magical Mystery Tour is not an album. <laughs> yes, it is, okay? Because I know for a fact you're the same people that are saying Yellow Submarine is an actual Beatles album, okay? So like, be quiet. Because like, at least the the B side of Magical Mystery Tour is just non-album singles. They weren't on an album already, therefore it is a new album because they were just singles. Now, Yellow Submarine, it's just compiled of like four new songs and then already existing songs and then just classical arrangements. Now, you're gonna tell me that it's a brand new album even though there are already recorded songs on that album? No, leave. Leave my house. How did you get into my house? Put the gun down. I'm getting insanely sidetracked right now. But yeah, Revolver is my one and a half first point five third second favorite Beatles album of all time. And the influence of this album is insane because just, you know, three months after this album was released, they started recording Sgt. Pepper where they took everything they knew from recording this and put it into like their magnum opus of the Beatles existence. And someday I'll get to doing a Sgt. Pepper's video. That will be a very long video and it'll be in a very long time, but someday and probably. For right now you got Sgt. Pepper's father, Revolver. But anyway, yeah, that is the video. Goodbye, bozos. Cue Monty Python intermission music now.